Hey everyone, ready for another uh, video. Uh, I haven't been doing them as frequently, but I'm excited to talk about this a little bit. Uh, today I wanted to talk about <clears throat> something that, that was striking me today as I was reading uh, God's Word and uh, was really hit by some of the patterns in Ecclesiastes and uh, was struck by just the universality of what is taught in Ecclesiastes about um, the spiritual uh, the spiritual condition of humanity and the reality of existential crisis in the midst of uh, in the midst of trying to find meaning in the world and <clears throat> there's a lot of places to go with this and I, I wanted to title this vid video Nihilism and Phariseeism because uh, not that I, I really feel adequately educated enough to, to compellingly tie a link between Nihilism and Phariseeism, but uh, that's just where I wanted to go in this video. And um, something that I wanted to, I think that's a good place to start out <clears throat> is the is the existential crisis that kind of happened in uh, the 18th century with philosophical reasoning. And uh, I, I'm not a philosopher by any means, uh, nor am I trained to be a philosopher, but I do think that, that you can take this one to the bank, what I'm about to say, is that philosophy doesn't have to do solely with human reasoning, it also has to do with uh, human morality. And so that's what existentialism really is. And the question of how do we know things and how do we come to conclusions has been debated for hundreds of years by philosophers, uh, whether it's by abductive reasoning or inductive reasoning. Uh, and philosophers have pointed out the problem with both of those. And uh, in the 17th or in the 18th century, a philosopher named David Hume, I talk about him in another one of my videos about miracles, he, he expresses skepticism in the ability of the human mind to master the things of nature. Basically, nature's here, and the human mind and the human ability to, to reason about what reality actually is, is skewed and is flawed. Um, but the, the scientific... Uh, revolution was was initiated from a, presupp a presupposition that that uh, said sorry I'm not expressing this well a presupposition that said that the university the uniformity of nature uh, allows us to basically make observations and to make details and whether we whether we realize it or not, we operate <clears throat> on the uniformity of nature. Uh, laws that exist within nature continue existing. Otherwise, the next time you get on an airplane, you wouldn't have a certainty that uh, the airplane would, would gain lift and be able to fly like the, the last 10 times that you did it. There would be no, there would be no consistency in your re reasoning and in the laws of nature. And so, Basically, what happened after the 18th century was was these uh, these givens. I'm gonna say, were were reevaluated and kind of doubted. And so there's a skepticism about the uniformity of nature, the ability of the human mind to understand things, um, and those were connected to the abandonment of God and the emergence of uh, scientific naturalism, and those were all connected to. Uh, Dar Darwinian scientific thought and, and theory and all those things were I think I mean that I don't I don't know the whole history of how they came to be or how people came to those conclusions but uh, uh, nor do I know how to adequately refute or disprove them but the the reality is that those were I think a reality is that those are symptomatic of a spiritual condition and um, so one of the, one of the things that I think uh, purely Dar Darwinian 
scientific thought which uh which upholds naturalism as the the worldview from which it emerges so like everything everything that we are and that we see um emerged in in this universe without uh, a specific order or a specific design and that is what led to uh an existential crisis uh bertrand russell david hume and ph other philosophers uh were really experiencing this um and and reasoning from that that existentialism and <clears throat> and to me like these these problems were were expressed adequately and and more simplistically in the the writings of solomon in the book of ecclesiastes and elsewhere in the, in the bible so uh and in that word meaninglessness so so solomon's basically saying i've been i've been everywhere i've seen it all i've done it all i've gained it all in the book of ecclesiastes he he was a very wise man um wiser than anybody and uh in his wisdom with his wisdom that was from god guiding him he also um, embraced things that God did not like and God did not approve of. And if you're familiar with Solomon's story, he um, ends up turning away from the Lord. I mean, I personally think he, in his old age, turned back because I think Ecclesiastes is a, is a rumination of Solomon when he's older. I mean, you don't have to go with my uh, opinion on this, but I think Solomon ruminates in, in, uh, on his life as he looks back in Ecclesiastes and uh, surveys everything that he had done, all that his hands had made. And if there's one word that uh, <clears throat> that you could get from Ecclesiastes uh, is the word meaninglessness um, or vanity. Solomon saying, all is vanity. All things under the sun is vanity. And he's trying to explore and, and see what, what is good for a person to do in the few days of their lives. I mean, we only live about um, 30,000 days in our lives. We have a few days. I mean, most of you probably have more money than that, <clears throat> than the days of, of your lives that you're going to live. But Solomon's saying, you know, there's so many, there's so much evil. And a lot of the evil he's talking about isn't just moral evil. It's also calamity. And, and he basically is, is looking for meaning in these things. He's looking for meaning in wisdom. He's looking for meaning in foolishness and pleasure. Um, basically hedonism uh, in in chasing women and living for the world you know you could think of it today in terms of you know a billionaire uh, living on a yacht uh, driving around in his Bugatti going to parties having having uh, multiple love interests all that type of, of stuff you know basically taking baths and piles of hundred dollar bills and um, and and also excelling in in, in uh, human intelligence and all these things and just and, and just growing and there's this desire there's this ambition in the human heart uh which isn't completely misplaced but uh i think it's it can be wrongly placed uh and it's this ambition to keep striving to keep stepping to keep pushing forward to keep gaining uh to succeed and <clears throat> and as a society to build a society that flourishes that is good where everybody treats each other right a utopia there are these noble ideals in the minds and hearts of men to reach towards those things and to strive towards those things uh and if you're familiar with the babel account which i bring up all the time i'm sorry for bringing it up again that's a perfect picture of it <clears throat> um people could say let us come together and build they have a a unique vision uh, something something that's coming from heaven even, something that's coming from the gods, divine insight. And they all come together in this plain in Mesopotamia and they start putting bricks together and building this utopia, this city, this civilization that's going to flourish, that's going to rival even God's kingdom itself. Um, and what does God do? He sees danger in it, the creator of men in their hearts and their minds. He comes down and he sees, uh, whoa, that's a red flag. Um, let me miraculously strike them with confusion, change their language, and scatter them from that point. So it shows how unhinged human ambition and succession or su success uh, is not always good in itself. <clears throat> it has
has to be tied to a creator. I look forward to Jesus's words. Jesus said, um, well, he said a lot, a lot of things pertaining to structuring our lives and our intelligence and our wisdom based on him. He said, if you, uh, obey my commandments, you will know the truth and you will, the truth will set you free. I'm not sure if I quoted that exactly right. <laughs> so forgive me. Um, but I'm just making a broader point. He also said, uh, that if you build your life on a foundation of shifting sand or you build your house on that sand, the winds will come and it will blow over that house. Um, and I think that that strikes me in as having, as corresponding to the, the Babel account and the account of what happened in the plains of Shinar in, all the way back in the book of Genesis. And so that's the beginning of what I wanted to talk about um, is that connection. And, and in, Solom in Solomon's writings, he says, look, there's nothing new under the sun. So even though we have these bright ideas, these scientific terminologies, we have these new technologies, we have these new successes, there's still an underlying condition that that is ruled over by... Um, by sin, by human moral degradation, by disunity with God. And those things need something higher than the biggest tower that we can build or the most insightful thought we can think or uh, the, the best act we can do in ourselves. It needs something higher than that to, to set us free from, from uh, the, the relativity being our own masters, being our own shepherds, being our own lawgivers. We need a freedom from that. And, uh, and so Jesus says, if you, if you obey me, if you obey, obey his word, his command, he will love you. He will give you another counselor who will come and live with you, will make his home within you. Um, and ultimately, Jesus had to be lifted up by, uh, by the world. He had to come into judgment by the world to, to, to be slain, to be killed, to be tortured for our sakes um, so that we could be free. And it, it didn't just merit belief in his teachings or belief in the existence of God, um, but I think that the, the 17, 1700s, the shift in human consciousness, the obedience to reason rather than an obedience to God represents a shadow of what's taught in scripture. Um, and so the next part that I wanted to move to, and you can you can draw these connections to yourself, um, is is just a picture in the scriptures. Uh, Jesus Jesus writing on the sand when the Pharisees bring. Excuse me, I have a little bit of uh, something going on in my chest, but just trying to get through this. Um, Jesus being brought the woman who's caught in adultery, and the Pharisees saying. Uh, this woman deserves to be stoned to death because she committed adultery. And, and they're probably right. The, the law of Moses commanded that they stone her to death. And so they're putting Jesus in a situation here. And the Pharisees are forcing Jesus to, to make a decision that they're going to judge him for um, and that they're trying to, of course, entrap him. But it shows the mindset of the Pharisee in this. What, he's, what the Pharisee is doing is he's bringing to Jesus a conflict that emerges from his own knowledge of good and evil, which itself is based on an understanding of the law of Moses in, whom, in whose seat these Pharisees sit. Remember, Jesus says, you've got to listen to the Pharisees because they do sit in Moses' seat, but do not do what they do because they don't practice what they preach, you know. Um, like in James, it says, don't just be a hearer of the word, be a doer of the word. Don't just hear it, but do it. Um, <clears throat> otherwise, it's hypocrisy. And that's like the modus operandi that Jesus keeps going back to for the hypocrites is like, they, they, they say and they do not do. They don't practice what they preach. They, they have this outward manifestation of righteousness, but inwardly, they are something completely else they are they're filled with abominations etc and so the pharisees bring this woman who's caught in adultery <clears throat> now adultery was never just the act of sexual relationship it was also a sign of spiritual rebellion against god and the the disunion of god's people uh 
Israelites. Remember, the, the Israelites, their problem was always turning back to idols, um, filling their hearts with abominations, uh, turning away from the living God who had delivered them, who had fought on their behalf. Uh, I wanted to keep this video under 15 minutes, but um, this is important. So, so they're bringing Jesus this, this circumstance, and they do this all the time, uh, situation after situation. And Jesus turns their attacks back on them, and he reveals that he is the one who actually gave the law with his father. Uh, and, and so he says he was without sin, cast the first stone, because Jesus recognizes, first of all, that there's no human who's uncorrupted to sin. Anybody who is, is a slave to sin uh, is ruled by sin. And so everybody's corrupted by sin, even the Pharisees. So he's pointing that out. And he's also pointing out that, hey, this, this adulteress that you're bringing is actually a picture of yourselves and the spiritual adultery that Israel has committed against Yahweh. And so they're being judged for that. Um, <clears throat> so Jesus is, is showing a picture of, of who he is, why he came, why he came to deliver people from, and that why people who reject his identity as the Messiah, his identity as the Son of God, as Yahweh in human flesh, will result in their death, in their sins, even if they have this outward manifestation of righteousness, even if they have this, this uh, glory that they make up for themselves, even if they are physically descended from Abraham, it doesn't matter because they're still corrupted by sin. They still need a savior. And that's, that's for all of us. Um, even today in the 20, I was going to say the 24th century, 2024, we still need to look beyond this scientific revolution, beyond our governments and our state entities, beyond our own hearts, uh, that that will lead us astray and lead us into foolishness and 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 many snares. We need to look to the shepherd and overseer of our souls, the Creator who made us. And uh, I think that's an important distinction. And the last note I wanted to end it on for a picture of the Pharisee is is just to remember that the Pharisees, uh, their condition is nothing new. Remember, there's nothing new under the sun. So you can look back into the oldest pages of Scripture and find uh, the the heart condition that that gave birth into the Pharisee. Remember Jesus in uh, John chapter eight says, <clears throat> you're not, you're not children of Ab or you're not children of God, you're children of the devil uh, because of their inability to hear his words because their obedience to the lie, the same lie of the serpent that happened in Genesis. And then in the chapter after Genesis chapter three, you have Cain and Abel. And remember in John chapter eight, Jesus says, your father was a liar and he was a murderer from the beginning. Um, so in Genesis 3, you have the lie. In Genesis 4, you have the murder. Uh, and that murder came because of jealousy, because of envy of Cain over his brother Abel and his uh, sacrifice that God was willing to accept while God wasn't accepting the sacrifice of, of Cain. And, and Cain uh, became downcast and angry and sullen. And God looked at him, and I, I think God loved him too, he said, "Why are you angry, Cain? Uh, it, be careful, because if you don't, if you don't rule over that sin, that sin is going to master you, and it's going to attack you and take over you. And the next thing that happens is, Cain kills his brother, and uh, that's a picture. That's a picture and a foreshadow of what the Pharisees ended up doing to Christ. You know, he gets put on trial before in front of the Sadducees. <clears throat> Anyways, and then one other picture is in." Um, 1 Samuel chapters 14 through 16, I believe, you have the account of the routing of the Philistines. So Saul, the king, I think newly imposed king of Israel, the first king ever who ruled over Israel. His son, Jonathan, is, uh, is really acting in bravery and in faith. And he says, he says, he takes his armor bearer and they go to this Philistine garrison and uh, rely on God's prompting to to lead him to the Philistine and uh God leads them up and they end up killing about 20 of the Philistines in Michmash and all this God God supernaturally puts the entire Philistine army into a panic after this and they all start kill like they start hitting each other with their swords they start scattering all over the place the the word the bible uses is melting so you can imagine just this land filled with panic and Saul you know, comes out and sees, sees what's going on and what's taking place. And 
and he goes to the priest and he says, bring the ark of God here. And, and then, he, and then he, he makes this foolish vow. And he says, cursed be any man who eats in, until I uh, avenge myself on my enemies. And, and so I think Saul is ruled by superstition. He's ruled by fear. He's ruled by self-righteousness. Um, he's ruled by anger um, and insecurity. He, he's got these things living in his heart. I, I think there's also some commendable qualities to Saul as well. Um, he does have faith. He does believe in God's existence. Uh, and, <clears throat> and that he is brave at times and he, and he does humble himself at times. So he does have some redeeming qualities, but in him is living this, this attitude of the Pharisees. And so of course, if you, if you're familiar with this story, uh, Paul, excuse me, Saul, uh, uh, he, he makes this vow and I think what happens, and you don't have to accept my word for this, just read the story yourself. I think what happens is he starts to envision this success and this victory is happening because of his righteous act, because of his vow, because of his, uh, his bringing the ark there and doing things that are right. And so, um, but the victory happens because of Jonathan's faith and because of the action of the Lord. Um, that's why the deliverance happens for Israel. And Israel was afraid before this. Remember, the Philistines are like, oh, look, the Israelites are finally crawling out of the holes that they're hiding in. Uh, and so so uh, Saul makes this vow, and they're going, nobody's eating, everybody's famished, they're at war, they should be eating because they need, they need energy uh, to fight. <clears throat> And Jonathan is going through the woods with the soldiers and there's honey literally oozing out of the ground and none of them are eating it because of the vow. But Jonathan doesn't know about the vow. Uh, so Saul's son dips his staff into the honey and tastes it. And <clears throat> then something happens. Um, I'm a little unclear on the next part of the story, but something happens where uh, Saul starts inquiring of, of the Lord of like who broke the vow or what's going on. So... Um, and of course, he inquires of the Lord and asks him and gets no answer because he's acting wickedly and God's ignoring him, right? And they end up finding out that Jonathan ate some of the honey and Saul's prepared to kill his own son, his son who delivered Israel uh, because his son disobeyed his rash and foolish vow, which was probably binding as an oath so often is spiritually. Um, but he, he, uh, you can see how reckless his self-righteousness is and how his knowledge of his own position in the eyes of God, he's overestimating his own, uh, his own spiritual value. He's overestimating his own action and underestimating, uh, the necessity of faith. And I think that's a picture of, of what is taught in the gospel, that we can't be saved by our own actions, by our own works, by our own self-righteousness. We have to be saved by grace through faith in the Son of God, and which, which takes a miracle. It takes literally looking at the cross and realizing that on that cross, when Jesus was lifted up, he took upon himself all of our sin, all of our suffering, all of our death. And he was crushed for our iniquities. He was killed for our transgressions. And uh, and so that's all I wanted to share with you today. Uh, just food for thought. If you like this and think it would help somebody who's considering these things or who might be bound by um, maybe the mentality of the Pharisee or maybe they're an atheist who's, who's struggling with nihilism um, and, and meaninglessness, just send this along to them and, uh, and have a good day. God bless you.